This is The Bandwagon, a podcast about baseball and bandwagon. I'm Hannah Kaiser, a baseball writer at Yahoo Sports, joined as always by Zach Kreiser, also a baseball writer at Yahoo Sports. Hello. Hello. We're, we're getting back to our roots. <laughs> yes, our roots of a previous <laughs> show that was the, called the same thing. Well, our roots in that we are going to talk about why you should root for one team or another team um, or both teams. Basically, we are within we're within like shouting range of the postseason. What we're really within is six weeks of the postseason. And there are six teams per league, 12 teams. There's two of us. 12 divided by two is six. So we're back to six. Yes. <laughs> six and is the number. That's how many, yeah, how many podcast episodes. episodes we have between now and the postseason. And so we are going to uh, take that convenient noticing of numbers and go through each of the postseason teams and tell you why you should bandwagon them. We're going to start with the ones that we know are in the postseason. And then by the time we get to the ones that we don't know yet, if they're in the postseason, hopefully we will know if they are in the postseason. So that's noticing later. of numbers. Noticing of numbers is a great alternative name for a baseball podcast. That's anyway, true. okay, <laughs> that can be when you are in charge of the podcast. Yes, when I name a <laughs> podcast, that'll be. Uh, so that's what we're going to do with our main segment: is talk through. This is going to so basically this starts our postseason preview in a way. We're going to dedicate half of the main segment of each episode to one of the postseason teams by the time we're done. Well, I told you about all the teams that are in the postseason in time for the postseason. Uh, but first, we're just going to do uh, we're just going to banter. We're going to talk about teams that are not. Well, we're going to talk team. about the news. We're going to talk, talk about, about we're going to talk about the news, starting with a team that that's not going to make the postseason. The Los Angeles Angels. We last did a podcast last Tuesday and then Wednesday night. Shohei Otani left his start after 26 pitches, and then he came back and DH'd in the second game. And then, where were you when you found out <laughs> that he had a torn UCL? Uh, I was in bed. I woke up the next morning and found out that's where I was. <laughs> same. Exactly same. <laughs> um, it was happening in Los Angeles on West Coast time, the second game of a doubleheader. Well, actually, it happened in the first game of a doubleheader. And then they announced after the second game of the doubleheader that Shohei Otani has a torn UCL. They have not announced a treatment plan. We seem, we as a baseball media, seem to just sort of be operating under the assumption that he will at some point need a second Tommy John surgery. So he is no longer pitching at the moment. He is still DHing. There's so many factors. <laughs> There's the fact that he's going to be a free agent. There's the fact that he hasn't gotten a second opinion yet. So he maybe is going to try to avoid this second Tommy John surgery. Is he ever going to pitch again? Is he going to transition to the bullpen? Is he going to hit while he recovers from this pitching surgery, like there's a lot. It's a lot. There's a lot happening. I there's also we should mention the part. So he had missed a start, left some other starts early recently with arm fatigue, is what they always called it. And uh, th the Angels, perhaps sensing the the mob uh, forming outside their door, <laughs> um, <laughs> has they injured Shohei Otani on a not successful postseason bid came out and said, hey, we, we offered him an MRI, we offered him imaging, and he and his agent declined. I don't really know what to make of that, other than Otani clearly didn't think he was that injured. Whatever. Not gonna think too hard about that. But here's my overall take about the future of Shohei Otani. I don't know if he'll get the surgery, like, tomorrow or in October, which he's clearly going to be unoccupied during. So I I think he'll get the surgery. I don't think that's really much of a question. I think it'll probably happen in early October. I don't know why people think he's not going to pitch again. I, I agree. Like, I understand the risk that it could be over. I wrote about it in the article I wrote about Otani's injury that someday this will end. He will have to go back to doing one or the other. Probably. But I, he's not going to do it without trying again. This is his yeah. whole thing. This is what he likes to do. He, 
given the choice, he would have done both at the same time from the day he showed up. And I don't know why anyone thinks that he's going to sign a whatever million dollar contract with a team that isn't going to let him do that. Like, right. this is his priority. That's what he wants to do. Maybe it won't work. Maybe he'll get hurt again. It may be an even shorter succession next time, given second Tommy Johns are just a little bit newer. We don't really know as much about them, but he's going to try again. And I think it'll be as a starter. I don't think he's going to be like, oh, it's OK. I can be a middle reliever now and mostly DH. Like, he's going to do the two way thing when he comes back. It's just a matter of whether it will be as successful as it has been for the last three years. Yeah, we should not make this podcast media criticism, but enough time has passed since this news initially broke that there's been a lot of reaction and uh, I have had reactions to those reactions. So, well, first bit of media criticism, I think my number one response to the week since we've learned about this has been it's wild that Shohei Otani has yet to address the media. and. This is a light criticism of Shohei Otani. Do not come <laughs> for me. I You mentioned that um, Perry Manizian, the GM, said that they had offered him. I don't, they didn't, I don't think he used the phrase, we offered him imaging. He just cut to the Otani declined imaging, implying that sure. they had offered it to him. And that came after, so he spoke, the injury was Wednesday. They were off Thursday. They were in New York Friday. Perry Manizian, the GM, spoke Friday. And then did not explicitly state that they had that they hadn't gotten imaging before or done before. Like there was, you know, there is, there are all these questions about, well, what about these games that he left before or the starts that he skipped? And so he had to come back out Saturday and offer this sort of defense of the Angels. And it is very hard to figure out what to do with any commentary coming from the angels when we're not getting any commentary coming from Otani, which is not to say that I think his comments would be adversarial or, you know, dis like antagonistic or sort of like they're lying about have him having declined the Im imagery. I just mean that it is the angels are only his employer for another two months or whatever. So all of these questions about like, what's he going to do in the future while certainly they involve the angels in the sense of like, does this make him more or less likely to return? They mostly just involve, to your point, like, what does he want to do? Because he is entering a time in his life of unprecedented literal agency to decide his future. And so if what he wants is to try to avoid Tommy John surgery, even if we think that's like, you know, just kind of kicking Borderline the can inevitable. down the road. Yeah. Like he can do that if he wants. He can try to find a team that will let him try to rehab it and while he's still hitting and not take any time. Like there's it's it is very hard to figure out what the future holds for Shohei Otani without hearing from Shohei Otani at a time when literally nobody else, including sort of his team, can speak for anything beyond the next two months. So I would love to hear from Shohei Otani or his agents. I do think they are playing it particularly close to the vest, not just because that is his want and his personality, but because of the impending free agency and the desire to kind of have as many answers for themselves as possible before they make any of those intentions public, which is fair, kind of. I say that's fair, and I actually mean it's not fair. Talk to the media, like I and like you could be uh, you could be evasive, but would love to have any kind of crumbs to work with while trying to figure out what it is that he is going to do. I my second bit of media criticism, as it were, is that this gets back to your point about like he is going to try to pitch. There have been a lot of people who reacted in like kind of a. Either the angels pushed him too hard way or just a, these two things simply cannot be done at the same time. It's too much. Uh, you know, he's so frail. I, I even saw some people like commenting on how like, well, he's never successfully done both. You know, he's, it's always like a, an issue staying on the field when he's trying to pitch and hit. I think it's like, not like, I don't say that as like people being like reputable reporters. I mean, like in the comment section or on tweets or whatever, but <laughs> The, to that, I say, like, he has been remarkably durable this year. I think we may have made that point on this podcast before, but, like, his, or I've certainly made that point, part of what makes Otani so special, like, the, his 
availability, his durability, the amount that he plays is not just a byproduct of having done of having of doing two things. It is a necessary component to doing two things. Like he is quite clearly like a physical anomaly in a way that allows him to do both for some amount of time. Like truly he has played in a shocking number of Angels games. Uh I like went down like a whole like trying to figure out how to express this in a way that truly resonates. Like he has played the most games of any Angels player this year. And some of them he has been both pitching and hitting. And like every other pitcher has played the fewest number of games. Like it goes Shohei Otani, all the position players, and then all the starting pitchers in terms of like games played. And I I think that we don't talk enough or spend enough time when we talk about his incredible skill set, talking about like, right, he must just physically be more durable, more able to tolerate discomfort, something that would allow him to be an outlier in that in the same way that I assume it'll allow him to be an outlier in coming back from a second Tommy John surgery. Like he's clearly just able to do physically difficult things that seem unreasonable even compared to other professional athletes. Yeah, I mean, I think his conditioning routine is uh, not well known, but it is well known that it exists and that it right. is very strenuous. Uh, you know, that is often given as like a where's Shohei Otani instead of talking to the media. And it's like, ah, he's doing whatever it takes to be a two way player. Right. Uh, you know, I think not right now, though. He could talk to us now. <laughs> the the only in like interesting indication we've gotten from Otani is just that he's continuing to hit. He could have stopped the the moment that his UCL was torn and that he found out he could have stopped right there. He would have been a lock for AL MVP. There would be nothing like on his resume that would be noticeably different if he stopped right then. Uh, and he has not. There was the viral video of him joking with Ellie De La Cruz at second base, like, an hour after he found out about the the elbow yes. injury, uh, like joking around, smiling. Like there's, he seems relatively okay with this in a hard to believe way, uh, just from the tea leaves and like reading facial expressions, which is all we ever do with Otani, which I think there's a larger conversation to be had about all of the uh, kind of mid 2010s, Furor over like we need baseball players to be more interesting and say more interesting things and it's like what if we had a baseball player who never said anything okay but, but that is getting kind of <laughs> annoying i would like him to say some things i would like him to say some things because there is no meaningful precedent because there are a lot of questions because it does feel very stupid to try to be uh to have to sort of uh, account for a future that ranges from like he never pitches again to like <laughs> he's the closer on the the team to use a starting bit like it is very difficult to figure out what to say now that we're like well i don't even know what hypotheticals we're dealing with because he hasn't told us what he wants i mean he wants to do everything you're right like that's what he wants is to do everything but i still wish he would say that i don't know you're right it's surprising that he didn't get the surgery already it's surprising that he was happy in that game i sent you the video of him kind of joking around with the fanatic the fanatic was joking and 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 Otani was there, and he didn't look <laughs> devastated. I don't know. His emotional no. resilience is also remarkable. <laughs> Do you want to talk about other really good players? I, I would like to talk about the team that actually surged into contention in the AL West like the Angels had hoped to. Yeah. Yeah. So the Mariners, the Seattle Mariners, lead the AL West now, which is a just remarkable change since the last time we talked, since anyone looked, since... I mean, pick a date where uh, you had taken stock of the AL West, and it is different now. Uh, Julio Rodriguez is on an absolute tear. The Mariners are now a game ahead of the Rangers and Astros when they part of been... that is because the Rangers, the Rangers also bad. doing the opposite of good. Yes, but the Mariners very, very good. Their offense has come alive again, mostly because of Julio Rodriguez and J.P. Crawford and some other guys, but. Julio Rodriguez and the pitching has always been good. So now the Mariners are suddenly the second best team in the American league. This is a um, fun fact that I have seen. And so I'm just going to rely on that having been true whenever I saw it 
I think the first time they've been in first place this late since like 2003, which really drives home the drought in a way that last year we paid a lot of attention to. And this year we stopped paying attention because it's over, but still kind of relevant because last year they didn't win the division. Last year, sorry, I'm going to have to try to Google this very quickly. 2022 MLB standings. I think there were like, what well, we said this on the, we said this on the pod. So we, I should remember. I think they were like 16 games back. They were, they were 16 games back of the Houston Astros last year. And now they are in first. Like that is just to say that even though they made the postseason last year, they weren't that much better. Um, and now they really are. It's very exciting. They're really good right now. Right now. They have, well, they're... yes, they're they're really good right now. I, I heard a statistic. I actually think this was Gary Cohen on the Mets broadcast last night uh, as he was calling the Rangers attempting to, you know, stave off their collapse. Uh the Mariners over their last 50 games have been a game better than the Tampa Bay Rays first 50 games this season, oh, which uh, that is fun. this is a classic thing that happens in baseball seasons. If you're really good at the start of the season, everyone thinks you're amazing. And if you're really good from like June to July, no one cares at all. And the Mariners are doing this to such an extreme degree that people have had to notice. But their well, stretch has been the most impressive they are being really good in August year. and now entering into September, which is another time that people care about you being very good. Uh, but not, not in the same way. Good. No one no one thought like, oh, this is a super... No, we didn't write any this is a super team stories about the Mariners in the last week or so when we That's wrote like they four have, about ex- the, the Rays. Ex- excuse me. The Mariners are going to be here in New York City in like <laughs> three days. One, two, three, three days. And then... Next week, we will have written about the super team, the Mariners. If they could stay good that long, that would be helpful. They'll be helped out by the fact that they are currently playing the Oakland A's. And then when they get yes. here, they will be playing the New York Mets. Uh, so that'll be good for both of them. Um, I was at the Rangers game yesterday and talking to some people on the Rangers beat. And I was like, after you guys leave, the Mariners get here. And they said, wow, what a big week for the Mets. And then they were like, well, what a big week for you a person who goes to the Mets <laughs> and I was like yeah it's kind of a medium week for the Mets because what does it matter to them they're not going anywhere um the real this is just like a little little experiential reporting for you the drop off in crowd size from the Angels to the Rangers was vast and the Angels are not even a good team they just have Shohei Otani as previously mentioned like I went to the Angels game on Sunday a lot of people there because everybody wants to see Shohei Otani. They had a lot of signs. Um, I think there were even more people there on like Friday and Saturday because those were the first two days that he was there. And then there was nobody there last night when <laughs> the very good postseason bound Texas Rangers were in town because the Mets are not great right now. Really weird. Really, really weird that the, neither New York team is any good. But the Mariners <laughs> will be here. They will be good. I will write about them. I'll write about Julio. It's mostly it's it is interesting because it's like their offense has been incredible and like there's so many like dynamic highlights from the games now that they're playing really well and um, then you go and like look at their roster resource page and they're like you know nineteenth in batting average and second in starting pitcher ERA so it's still really the pitching that is like their strength as an organization um, and also. The reason why having traded Paul Seawald for bench bats was not like a capitulation at the deadline. It was it was actually a buying and selling at the same time type situation uh, and doesn't seem to have affected them too much emotionally. Yeah, emotionally does not seem to have cratered them like the Kendall Graven move did a few years ago. And I will say they're not bench bats. Those guys play like almost every day for them. Uh, but yes, well, okay. it down the lineup bats it's not like <laughs> they went out and got there's no there were they, no actually you know what there were no all good offensive players traded at the deadline so yeah so congrats to them <laughs> good for the mariners uh which you know paul seawald worked out great for the diamondbacks too but yeah they have found a way mostly again julio has kicked into like optimus prime gear and like gone hellaciously hot the past month and They've had a few guys who are just better than they've been before, J.P. Crawford being the main one. Eugenio Suarez has been hot for the last couple months, which helps. But yeah, I mean, the baseline success of this team that has been true all year is that they might have the best starting rotation in baseball. And they certainly have a very competent major league starter to roll out every single night. 
which is a, a real contrast to, I don't know, the Mets, uh, to a lot of teams that Rude. seemingly worked a lot harder at it from an external addition point of view. And you can see that in their bullpen, too. I, I think Ken Rosenthal wrote out a bullet point list of all their relievers and how they got them. And it was like waiver claim, waiver claim, picked up off minor league contract, waiver claim, traded for a guy you've never heard of. I mean, it's just a list of no investment whatsoever in getting them and then turning them into really useful players. So the Mariners are doing something very right on the pitching front. Can I run a very weird thought by you? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to text you right now. Okay. Great, great audio content. A picture of Julio Rodriguez from a recent <laughs> game. Did you get it? Not yet. <laughs> Now I, I was, got it. I see I was, it. Yes. I was watching the game last night and they showed him in the dugout and I said, wait, wait, rewind to Jake, my <laughs> husband. And he said, what is it that I have to rewind for? And I said, Julio's hair looks really long. And he was like, long enough that it's worth rewinding. And I said, yes. And I said, in fact, the longer you wait, the more we're going to have to rewind. And so we, <laughs> <laughs> we rewound. Is he is this is he not cutting his hair while they're doing really well? Is this? Do you think there's like a superstition thing going on? His hair looks longer, right? His hair definitely looks longer than it has been in the majors before. I mean, maybe I he's just busy. Should, I was going to say he might be busy or it could be a I'm not getting uh, a haircut until I stop hitting type situation. That, that, I mean, that would be a very baseball player thing to do. It would. So and they bring the barbers to the clubhouse. So the business oh, he has opportunities factor. to yeah. get a haircut. Yes, he definitely has opportunity to get a haircut. So this would seem to be either a choice or uh, an external reason for not right. getting. You you should ask him. You should ask Julio if he's growing out his hair because they're winning. I will. I mean, possibly he's just growing out his hair because he thinks his hair looks better longer. Sure. And that's also a perfectly fine choice, but it is pretty notable. It is definitely longer than it has been. And again, come back next week, check Yahoo Sports for an update on whether I just sent you a picture of his hair um, at the Home Run Derby so you could see that it was a lot shorter. I, I be- Yeah, I, I remember <laughs> how his hair looked. It, it, yeah, it's usually like a very close fade yeah. type situation. It's and now like- it's, you know growing out a little now it's grown out a little all right that's all that's just i'm just positing a theory that he is a superstitious player and he is that's that's another way of emphasizing that we could read you the numbers about how good he's been but instead we're just going to say um, he's yeah. so good that he is taken to acts of superstition i, was no longer <laughs> I don't I, I don't know if that's true but i am going to read you the numbers <laughs> of how good he's been because I, <laughs> that's what we're going to do so here here's julio rodriguez's line since august 1st uh, he's batting 429, 474, 724. Uh, he has seven home runs and 11 stolen bases. And that comes out to, if you use uh, fan graphs, you're familiar with WRC+, Plus, which is just a fancy way of saying the percentage, how much better he has been than the average major league hitter. So his WRC+, Plus is 232, which means 132% better than the average major league hitter. Keep that in this, mind. Okay. This this has been Zach Crasher's podcast, Noticing Numbers. <laughs> Noticing Numbers. <laughs> Noticing uh, Numbers, a baseball podcast. <laughs> so everyone's talking about Julio, rightfully so. Unbelievable. Lifted the Mariners back into contention, and he has not been the best hitter in the majors in August. Wait, that don't do a transition. Been... I Why? Because I have a game for you. We, we're bantering about the... It's in the... Well, Look. I'm don't, talk, don't banter about the... Dot. Okay, fine. Oh, okay. spoiler! <laughs> it's Mookie Betts. Okay, we're gonna get to that later because I'm bandwagoning the Dodgers <laughs> this week. But before we bandwagon anybody, we need to play a quick game. You ready? But the, okay, the, there is a there is a banter in the thing. Well, I see that, but I I was gonna use that. Fine. What did you want to banter? Well, I thought we were bantering that Mookie overtook Acuna. Yes, he did, and they. Doesn't that don't you think that that fits in well with our bandwagon segment in which you'll be bandwagoning the Braves and I'll be bandwagoning the Dodgers and I'll say stop rooting for the Braves because their best guy is over. <laughs> My best guy is in. Uh, maybe. I don't know. I was just going <laughs> off what's in the doc. <laughs> I was reading the doc. Sorry. Zach is on <laughs> vacation in a very boring parts of the country. 
<laughs> and so you, <laughs> we didn't get to talk through the doc necessarily until right now. Um, no, you're right. We should maybe banter about the part where people ran onto the field and uh, pleasantly or accosted Ronald Acuna Jr. in what they thought was it a pleasant look way. Pleasant. Yeah. Yes, it, I should say it was not pleasant, but I'm just saying, like, I don't think it was as dangerous as it seemed, but it seemed dangerous, which is not how you want things to seem when strangers run onto the field. So don't do that if you're a person who wants to hug a baseball player. It's weird when people do that. It's not the first time someone has run onto the field trying to hug a baseball player. No, Cody Bellinger had a little like, it seemed like it, maybe it was a thing on TikTok and I just wasn't aware, but like multiple people tried to hug Cody Bellinger. Yes. A couple seasons ago in L.A. And multiple people at once tried to hug Ronald Acuna Jr. last night. Last night. And it yeah. was um, less fun even than when they tried to hug Cody Bellinger. And that was not OK either. OK. Now can we play a game? Sure. OK. We're going to play a game. The game is called Best Player on a Bad Team. Okay. So you can probably figure out how this game works. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you the bad team. And you tell me the best player on that bad team. Uh, and by, um, by what metric? By Fangraph's War. Okay. Okay. So remember, Fangraph's War, less kind to pitchers than baseball reference war. Um, and I will, I'll specify if it's a position player or a pitcher. Uh, uh, you don't need to. Let, let's try oh, it without. Let's try right. it without. Um, and my apologies to some teams that are not terrible, that, but that we included in the best player on a bad team game because I needed 10. So <laughs> first up, is a team that's actually bad. The Colorado Rockies. Who's the best player on the Colorado Rockies? Oh, we're doing just this year. Just this year. Oh, okay. I thought I was going to be pulling out like the oh, no. 2012 oh White God. Sox or something. No. Okay. Uh, Colorado Rockies this year. I. <laughs> yeah. Who has Sorry. played the most for the Colorado Rockies? It's a great I question. I think the best player on the Colorado Rockies. Is it just Ryan McMahon? It is Ryan McMahon. Yeah. Okay. I thought that was going to be harder because Ryan McMahon is a person who has a 104 OPS plus. So he is He's four, very good at defense. Four yes. percent better. Uh by WRC plus even 100, just a 100, just a league average mm -hmm. hitter who is their best player by war. He has um all of 1.7 war. <laughs> Congrats to you, Ryan McMahon. Okay. The St. Louis Cardinals. This one's easy. Is it just Goldschmidt? Yeah, it is. Okay. He's an actually okay. good player. Okay. Yes. Uh, the Pirates. Hmm. Well, earlier in the season, it would have felt pretty sure. I would have felt pretty sure it was Mitch Keller. He has been worse recently. Uh, I think it... Is it Jack Sawinski? No, it's Mitch Keller. Oh, okay. It's still Mitch Keller. Uh, Jack Sawinski is their third best position player behind uh, Key Brian Hayes and Brian Reynolds. Key Brian Hayes really mm -hmm. racking up the war despite only playing in 98 I was going to say, Key Brian Hayes has been hurt a lot. But pretty good. Okay. Pretty good for Key Brian Hayes. Yeah. Uh, Mitch Keller, best player on the Pirates this year. Okay. The A's. Oakland A's. Best player on the Oakland A's. Ryan Noda. What? How did you know that? He's been pretty good. Yeah, but... He walks I, a lot. I thought for sure you were going to say Brent Rooker, and I was going to be like, not anymore. No, Brent, Brent Rooker, Rooker was... DHs too much. It's really hard to be the top player when you DH. Not if you're Shohei Otani. Shohei Otani has more war as a DH than anyone else in the AL plays defense by like a full win. I didn't say it was impossible, just really hard. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, Brent Rooker all the way down to third best position player on the A's. Okay. All right. You're doing better at this game than I thought you were going to do. Apparently, I don't know these bad teams as well as you do. The Detroit Tigers. Huh. So they've had a couple good breakout stories this year, but I don't know that all of them have played the whole season. Uh, You know, I'm going to guess the good breakout story anyway. Let's go with yeah, no, I, he's a DH. I really don't think it's him. I was going to say Kerry Carpenter, just for the record. That's who I was considering. I'm going to not say him. I will go with... 
Mm, I'll go with Riley Green. Okay, Riley Green is their best position player. Kyra Carpenter is their second best position player, but mm-hmm. their best player, Eduardo Rodriguez. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. That should have been, yeah. Because he's so happy in Detroit. Yeah, I forgot he was still there, <laughs> to be honest. So. <laughs> All right, the White Sox. The White Sox best player this year by Fangraphs War is interesting because it actually might help some of their pitchers who have been bad by the surface level numbers. Uh, but oh, oh, it's Luis Robert. It's Luis yes, it Robert. is. Yeah, it's Luis Robert is Luis Robert is the best player uh, on this list of best players on bad yes. teams. He's which really drives. Good. Really drives home how much the White Sox failed at this rebuild because they had these good players. Um, also, he's got 34 home runs, which did not surprise me nearly as much as his 16 stolen bases. So, I don't know. Uh, the Washington Nationals. Who is the best player on the Washington Nationals? Do they have to still be on the Washington Nationals? <laughs> no, they do not. Great question. Oh, it, it's Jamer Candelario. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, Jamer Candelario is still the best player by war on the Washington Nationals. Um, and then on the actual Washington Nationals, currently it is Lane Thomas, but we're going to give it to Jamer Candelario. When I was talking to manager Dave Martinez when they were in town recently, he referred to Jamer Candelario as Candy. And I was like, ooh, I like that as a nickname for Jamer Candelario. Mm-hmm. That works. So I'm going to start calling him Candy, at least in my head. All right, Padres. Uh, they have a lot of good players. Let's see. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's actually, I'm pretty sure it's Hassan Kim. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, they have so many dudes who would be the best player on all these other teams. And then they still don't win. They still don't win. It's remarkable how good yeah. they are without being good. They are the only team now that has a like positive run differential that is below teams with negative run differentials. If you like look at the standings, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like they and are they're way below. Way below. Like they are, they should it makes no sense that they are still so bad. They should really be better. All right. Um, we're going to make it a little bit harder for these last two because you're better at this than... Man, you're really good at my games. I got to make my games harder. Uh, the Who is the second best... Well, no. Who is the best position player on the Giants? Because Logan Webb is like their best player by... Very a obviously the best player. Uh, yes. The who second the best... best posi- well, I don't player. think the second best, so the, but the best, the best position player. The top position player on the Giants. They have had like every guy on the Giants has had one good month and then come back to earth. Uh, Whose month I was the best month? Think, I think the answer is Tyro Estrada. But yes, I it could... is. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. Wow, you're so good at this game. Um, okay. Noticing like... numbers. Noticing numbers. Yes. You should you should use this game as like your resume for something. Uh, <laughs> All right, and then the the team that started this all, the team that that inspired me to do this, was the Royals because Bobby Wood Jr. very very good, and I was like, wow, mm-hmm. he is so good, and we don't notice him because he's on such a bad team. So after Bobby Wood Jr., who was the mm-hmm. second best player on the Kansas City Royals, yikes! Uh, <laughs> so I Vinny Pasquantino has been hurt. Almost all season. Yeah, he's Otherwise, I'm pretty sure it would have been him. Uh, but he's been way too hurt. I, I oof. the pitching has been better recently. Uh, which is you're, you're on the right track. Yeah. So I'm gonna go with Brady Singer. It is Brady Singer. Yeah. The, yeah. the other guy I was considering was Michael Garcia, who I could not pick out of a lineup, but. I know has played good defense and occasionally hit the ball, which is pretty much as much as you can ask for non Bobby Witt Royals. Uh, Mikhail Garcia. Are we calling him Michael or Mikhail? His I'm not sure. I don't know. I have, I've not spoken to the man. He is the second best position player and um, his WRC plus is 87. So uh-huh. that's, how, <laughs> that's how not good their position players are. Uh, but yeah, it is Brady Singer and it is a pretty steep drop off from Bobby Witt at 4.9 F4 to Brady Singer at 2.0 F4. Yeah. If the Royals were even a little bit good, Bobby Witt Jr. would be getting pretty serious, like second place yes. MVP consideration. Um, Zach, you went eight for 10 on the best player on a bad team quiz. You are very good at knowing the best the best players on the bad B teams. B minus. That was pretty good. I think that was good. I was impressed. 
Uh, okay, we're gonna take a quick break, and then when we come back, we will we'll bandwagon some teams. Good teams. Good teams. We are back, and as promised, we're gonna start to preview the postseason. Uh, and we are going to do that in a bandwagon fashion by telling you why the teams that are in the postseason are fun and why you should consider rooting for them. If, say, for example, you root for, I don't know, either New York team and you need a new team for, for the postseason. Zach, who are we bandwagoning this week? Well, well who are you bandwagoning this week? And then I'll bandwagon somebody else. Yeah, I am bandwagoning the the team with the best record in the major leagues that would be the atlanta braves they of the seven superstars signed forever uh that is just rolling merrily along according to alex anthopoulos's grand plan to take over the world um we obviously did a whole episode about the braves fairly recently we don't need to rehash everything about the Braves. And in fact, I'm not going to rehash much about the actual good Braves that you know about. I'm going to talk about Eddie Rosario. Uh, so Eddie Rosario came over to the Braves in a deadline trade as part of their 2021. Our outfield is bad. Let's get all of the outfielders trade deadline. And he pretty much immediately turned into a different person. He was hitting 254, 296, 389 for the 2021 Cleveland baseball team. And as soon as he got to the Braves, he just became like 50% better, hit 271, 330, 573 the rest of the year, won the NLCS pretty much by himself. And, you know, he was actually not very good in limited playing time last year for the Braves. And this is, I mean, he was actually quite bad last year, but for some reason, is still around. I think he had uh, an injury or an eye issue that was plaguing him. It was an eye issue, I'm pretty sure. And they got that fixed, and voila, he has 20 homers this year. He's the most recent guy on this team to get to 20 homers, and there are a lot of guys with 20 homers. This team, this is why I'm talking about Eddie Rosario, the Braves are going to break the record, probably, for home runs by a team in a season and they're going to break a record that was set by Eddie Rosario's 2019 Minnesota twins. So he was really, really good for that team. That entire team was just, they didn't really do anything except hit home runs, but they hit a lot of home runs. It was the peak of the juiced ball era. Like that was the, the tippy top of the ball flying. So that team is what the Braves are going to eclipse with the home run rate not being like that this season. They're going to do it in a somewhat more neutral uh, home run environment. And I think that Eddie Rosario is a great case of why the Braves are so good at all times, which is everyone that comes over to the Braves seems to just, they don't need to be the best player on the team which Eddie Rosario arguably was one of the best players on those. Uh, he was certainly one of the most relevant players on that Twins team. And he is, like, maybe not a top 10 player on the Braves right now, but he's hitting 20 home runs. He is being his best self. They waited out this eye problem and got him back to full form. And they just have so many of those guys. They have one guy on the team at all times who just does not play. Right now, that's Nicky Lopez. Sorry, Nicky Lopez. You were amazing for two weeks while Ozzy Albies was hurt, and now you are never going to play again until you get the game-winning hit in the NLCS. And that is the Braves. That's what they do. They have all these great players that you know of that they've signed forever, and then also they have Eddie Rosario, who would be like the third best player on your favorite team. I did see a good tweet. That was like Nicky Lopez, future NLCS MVP. And I was like, that's so, that is giving, it is, it is giving Eddie Rosario 2021 <laughs> is what Nicky Lopez <laughs> is giving, as the kids would say. Um, well, are they fun? The Braves? They are, are fun. They, just... <laughs> they hit home runs. 
They, mm-hmm. Okay, look, here's the here's the argument for the Braves. I, I actually do think Ronald Acuna Jr. and Ozzy Albies, their buddy comedy routine is fun. I do love friends. Friends are fun. Friends are fun. They both hit home runs and steal a lot, which really, what else do you want? Michael Harris Jr. is a superlative defensive center fielder, which center field defense highlights are fun. Uh, Matt Olson is big Mark McGuire vibes in terms of just hitting home runs without moving his feet. Uh, and yeah, I think all of that adds up, but I think the biggest reason to root for the Braves is they could, well, this is not really a reason to root for them. This is a reason (laughs) for the larger baseball world to be okay with them winning, which is, I think if they won this year, they would take over top villain final boss status from the Astros. Oh, and a, I think it's great for baseball to have a villain at all times. It's clearly not the Yankees right now. They're Dude, not. Good you're on the that. record saying that, and I think it's a good point. I, yes, and the Braves are. You can't really. You cannot bring up the cheating thing with them. They do not have the cheating part. <laughs> well, that we not, know of. <laughs> not anymore. I mean, <laughs> they had they did, the minor they, league. Uh, they did have a GM who got like banned yes. for life and then unbanned. Uh, unrelated to the current roster uh so i think it would be a more interesting conversation it would be much closer to the yankees core four situation from the 90s if the current braves won another world series and became kind of the dominant last team you have to beat of baseball which if you know if you made me choose an outcome i think that's uh, a very likely outcome given how long these guys are signed for and how good they are uh the only star on this team who is not signed forever is max freed and you know they're either going to sign him forever or he's gonna leave and then they're gonna immediately trade for someone even better than him which is just how the braves work so that's that's the the reason to root for the braves is that it gives baseball a dominant overarching final boss is there someone who is exactly like Max Fried, but a little bit younger and from the Georgia area? <laughs> that's <laughs> the who they Georgia will replace area. him with. I was yeah, just Max Googling Fried's from a, California, too far from away. From California now? Yeah, exactly. That's uh, He's going to get Freddie Freeman, and <laughs> they're going to find someone who is like him, but younger and from that area. Because Freddie Freeman also from California. They're like, you're going to need to leave. We don't like, um, you know what? I don't know that you made a compelling case for rooting for the Braves so much as you did make a compelling case for embracing the inevitable reality that they win, which mm-hmm. does seem to be remarkably the future. It's like, I'm going to write about that actually later this week. So uh, we haven't talked about this yet. Later this week, I'm going to do a story that's like what the World Series odds tell us because uh, we spend so much time talking about like postseason odds and like the angels the postseason odds they're going down um and then i was going to do something that's like all right forget all the teams that are not making the postseason let's look at the world series odds for the teams that are making the postseason um and what they mostly tell you is that it's easy for the good nl teams to make the world series because the other nl teams are not very good uh it's you know what i mean like it's a weird kind of like it goes like two nl teams then the whole al then the rest of the nl <laughs> Well, I think what it it tells you it should be easy and right. also that the numbers are still pretty small because the postseason is the postseason. crazy. Um and yet the Braves still feel pretty pretty inevitable. Wow, a lot of a lot of ways to get from there. We don't we are, we we by, bypassed that Freddie Freeman transition. Um and if I could like reverse, I would take it. I would take that exit and say You know who I actually didn't <laughs> talk about? Who didn't you talk about? Ronald, Ronald Acuna Jr. Uh, okay. Because I talked about him a lot last episode when we talked about the Braves. But uh, he's pretty good, huh? Uh-huh. And you know who's even better than him lately is Mookie Betts. Uh, Mookie Betts has surpassed Ronald Acuna Jr. as, what is it? It's like the 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 Vegas favorite. I don't know how well, that Well, he's works. the betting favorite for he's NL MVP. The- he also surpassed him in war. Oh, that's even more. I like that number yes. better. So he surpassed him in war. And he's very good. He also has a podcast. So in preparing for this, <laughs> in preparing for this podcast, I think I kind of knew this. Did you know that Mookie Betts had a podcast? I did. I see the, I, I mean, I don't listen to it on a podcasting app, but I do follow Mookie Betts on Instagram and he, he oh. puts a lot of the podcast clips on Instagram. Oh my gosh. I am so interested in which baseball players you follow on Instagram. 
producer John, at some point in the offseason, in like the depths <laughs> of the offseason, in like the second week of January, we should just talk about like who, which which athletes we follow on Instagram. Because I am surprised to learn you follow any of them on Instagram. Uh, yeah, Mookie Betts has a podcast. I like vaguely knew this fact and I had never listened to an episode or watched an episode because they are on YouTube like the bandwagon. And then I did so in preparation for this podcast and you did not respond to the screenshots I sent you. That's fine. I sent you some... <laughs> <laughs> it's always him sitting on a couch and the couches become progressively swankier as the season goes on and he's always wearing sunglasses inside and his guest <laughs> is not generally wearing sunglasses because they're inside and they 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 play a game that they kind of stole from uh our show called on base off base what is that game you say it's fan not a fan basically um and um, I watched the episode in which he spoke to Clayton Kershaw because did you know that among all pitchers who have thrown at least a hundred innings, I should have phrased this as a question, but in a more question new way, that among all pitchers who have thrown at least a hundred innings, Clayton Kershaw has the best ERA this year? He's been really Clayton Kershaw good. is always like his ERA is always like 2.4 and it's just, okay, yeah. that's what he does. And everyone's yeah. not even excited about it anymore. Yeah. Um, he last finished in the top five for Cy Young voting in 2017. Do I think he'll finish in the top five for Cy Young voting this year? Probably not, because he hasn't actually thrown that many innings. But he has thrown 100 innings, which is the cutoff I said of that. <laughs> um, and in that time, he has a 2.54 ERA, a 173 ERA plus. Uh, he wears Skechers on the mound, which I learned from the podcast that he did with Moogie Betts, in which Moogie Betts teased him about wearing Skechers on the mound. Um, I was going to say that should uh, that should make his ERA lower just for the fact that he's doing it in Skechers anyway. Yeah. And he doesn't believe in ghosts and quote, I love the Fister, which is the hotel that Moogie Betts wouldn't stay at because he's afraid of ghosts. So <laughs> team Clayton Kershaw in that debate, I guess. OK, let's talk about the Dodgers as a whole. This will be the 11th year in a row that they make the postseason and also the 11th year in a row that they've either finished first or won 106 games. Very inconvenient that they finished second in the year that they won 106 games. It makes it tricky to. You know. uh, since 2013, they lead all of baseball in wins, duh, uh, at 1,012. The next highest is the New York Yankees. The difference between how many wins Dodgers have and the Yankees, so between first and second, is the same as the difference between second and 15th. So they are basically <laughs> an entire average difference in Major League Baseball wins away from the second place team since 2013. Uh, that doesn't always I think we'd call that a standard deviation. A standard statistics. deviation. <laughs> yes. They are like, what, 14 standard deviations away from. No, 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 no. Ranking, they're one. One is very big in standard deviations. Anyway. Okay, fair. fine. Noticing numbers. <laughs> Podcast from Zach. <laughs> <laughs> um, on July 2nd, they uh, they finished out a losing series to the Kansas City Royals that put them three games back in the division. And they were still, you know, that's fine. Everyone was like, this is the year. They're going to kind of take off. We're, to go even further back in the offseason, they didn't do that much. And everyone was like, okay, they're, they're, they're rebooting. They're resetting their luxury tax, which they didn't get to do um, because of Trevor Bauer's suspension getting reduced. But they were pretty inactive in the trade deadline or in the offseason anyway. So they were not as good. Didn't sign any new shortstops. Then the shortstop that they didn't sign any new shortstops because they were going to play got hurt. And then they were like, not so great. They were good, but not so great in most of the regular season. And then since July 2nd, they have gone 35 and 12, which is uh, 120 win pace. So they've been really good lately in the time that Mookie Betts has passed Ronald Acuna Jr. for the betting favorite for. AL, or NL MVP, sorry. Um, and just like you talked about Eddie Rosario, I am going to talk about Lance Lynn. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, the Dodgers, this is from a Fox Sports article. The Dodgers enter the trade deadline with one of the five worst rotation ERAs in baseball coming off a month in July. July, famously, the last month before the trade deadline, in which their starters compiled the worst ERA in any month in the franchise's Los Angeles history. And then they failed to get um, Eduardo Rodriguez. And they also <laughs> failed to get any of the more like notable pitchers who were getting moved at the deadline. And there were some notable pitchers getting moved at the deadline. And instead, they got Lance Lynn. Before they traded for Lance Lynn, he was pitching for the Chicago White Sox. He had a 
6.47 ERA. <laughs> he had racked up a lot of innings because what else were the Chicago White Sox doing but running out Lance Lynn? Um, and since then, he has, uh, since then, he, where is, I have it somewhere. Since then, he has a 2.03 ERA. He is 4-0 and with the <laughs> Dodgers. I, it is, I did not know. So, like, the whole thing with the Dodgers is, like, Andrew Heaney and, like, they, they, where do they get these pitchers? And then they turn them into great pitchers. But I didn't know that they could do that literally overnight with a guy in his 30s who was, like, just having a bad year, as guys in their 30s are wont to do. Um, but they did with Lance Lynn. In fact, all of the bad players that they acquired are now good players because they play for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Let's just take a quick tour through some of the bad players who are now good. Talked about Lance Lynn. Who else did they get at the trade deadline? They got Joe Kelly. He was also with the White Sox. Uh, he had a 4.97 ERA with the White Sox. I mean, he currently has like a, a 0.00 ERA, but basically he has yet to give up a run with the, with the Dodgers. They got Ahmed Rosario. He has the same number of home runs, which is three, in 74 plate appearances with the Dodgers as he did in 412 plate appearances with Cleveland. They brought back Kike Hernandez. His WRC Plus in Boston, 59. His WRC Plus in L.A., 101. They got Ryan Yarborough. He was pitching for the Royals, apparently. I thought he was, I didn't know he was on the Royals. Uh, he had a 4.24 ERA, not terrible, with the Royals. He has a 2.35 ERA with the Dodgers. I understand that all of these are small sample sizes, but it is an it's incredibly fast turn. All like together, it's, it's a big sample size. All <laughs> together, like, oh, all of them are good now. Yes, it's like, they, and even if it's a small sample size, that's fine because that's what post trade trade deadline acquisitions are. They're just like you need a thing, and then you get a guy, and then all the guys they got are doing the thing they need them to do, which is incredible, mirroring what Jason Hayward has been doing for them this whole year. So not a trade deadline acquisition, but an off season acquisition. Last year was he was with the Cubs, and it was the second of two years that he was bad with the Cubs. And it was like sad and kind of awkward because he had been. It real... seemed like he was going to retire. Oh, yeah. Like they did him like the kind thing of telling him they were going to release him so he could get a farewell tour ish in the very end of the season because it was like, oh, we're not like, we're not sending you away angrily because you did a lot. The like World Series hero, Jason Hayward, but you, you've been bad. Over the last two seasons with the Chicago Cubs, WRC plus was 70 and 61. And then, right. So they told him he was getting released and he got released and he signed a minor league deal with the Dodgers. And they've been uh, not playing him all that much, but playing him strategically. And it's working out great. He's got, now he's got a 119 WRC plus. He's reunited with Freddie Freeman. Uh, and I just feel like the Dodgers are fun. You should root for them because. If you want to root for anyone, you want them to be on the Dodgers. Like if any, if any of your favorite players, uh, you know, they're getting older. Age comes for all of us. They're not their old selves anymore. They're 36 maybe. And, you know, the ravages of time. <laughs> you just want them to sign <laughs> with the Dodgers because then they'll be great. Then they'll be rejuvenated. Then they'll be like the stars of New York Times articles like Freddie Freeman was. That was like a perfect team player for a perfect team. That's not exactly what it was, but it was basically that. It was just like it was like there was a New York Times article about him. And I thought no one would have seen that this was coming because he was like, right. He was. It seemed like he was going to retire. And then instead, he's getting articles that says a perfect marriage between team and player. Jason Hayward is on a winning club, has been reunited with Freddie Freeman and is having fun playing baseball game. The Dodgers are loving every minute. Um, yeah, I don't know. That seems like a reason to root for the Dodgers is because they make everybody better. They make everybody better. Also, James Altman has too much hair. What? I mean, when you look at James Altman, what do you think? I think, where's all that hair coming from? Like, it looks like he's more, not that he has long hair, but that, like, he's got more hair follicles than makes sense for the density of his <laughs> scalp. I, I don't think about that. No, I, I mostly think about my thing with James Altman is I keep wondering if he's going to have the exact same career path as Cody Bellinger where oh, wow. uh, cool. he's like this, then he's going to like win MVP next year. And then he's going to strike out way too much and not be good for a couple of years. Then he's going to go to another team and come back. And it's like, okay, I don't know. This seems very similar other it, than the first base part. 
Cody Ballinger is really the anti everything I just said about the Dodgers. <laughs> where I'm like, who could be bad on the Dodgers? And it's like the guy who's great on the Dodgers. I'm sending you pictures of James Outman having too much hair. Again, what is with your hair thing today? There's just a <laughs> that's bunch true, of that, pictures that, of <laughs> baseball players with hair. Um, it's just true. There's two noticings of hair. Uh, but you know what I'm talking about? Like, it's not just that it's long. It's that it's thick. It's, it's, it's unnaturally thick. Uh, okay. Uh, and so root for the Los Angeles Dodgers, the hairiest team full of people enjoying a resurgence. That's how we used to do the bandwagon episodes. Is we'd end with like a cute little yes. line, but I would have written it ahead of time. And so it would be better than that just was. Um, <laughs> when the Dodgers and the Braves meet in the NLCS, I haven't, I haven't looked at the standings to figure out if that's possible, but who would win? The Dodgers between the Dodgers and the Braves. Yeah. Uh, Freddie Freeman's extended family. I don't know. Uh, sure. You know, I, I would still take the Braves right now. I think they have more pitching that is reliable, but uh, I think Mookie Betts is best. I, I think the Dodgers have the two best players. I yes, think Mookie Betts Mookie and Betts Freddie and... Freeman are the best players. Yes. Uh, which I did sometimes like a... matters a lot in the postseason. This is like a very, again, roundabout way of kind of saying that because they're also just like literally the two of the best players. Um, but we were looking at, Last night, Jake and I were talking about like who's been really good since the All Star break because Julio Rodriguez has been so good since the All Star break, and it's like Shohei Otani, Mookie Betts, Freddie Freeman, and then guys like other like him. It's like it's just like they're good all the time. They're good in small samples. They're good in big samples. <laughs> they're the two best players. Um, yeah, are we've you gotten to the yeah. we've gotten to the stage with Mookie Betts where you know most. I, I saw a good tweet about this, and I'm sorry I don't remember who did it, but the. Most years since like Barry Bonds retired, if you go from then to now, the best player is Mike Trout. But we've officially gotten there's a few years in a row now where since then to now it's Mookie Betts and he's going to be that. I, I know Shohei Otani exists. Mookie Betts uh, is. He has a little bit more of a track record of being healthy and the, it just keeps him a little bit ahead. It keeps yes. him a little bit of a little bit ahead and he's been a superlative defender in addition to hitting which allows him to rack up about the same war total at peak as otani and uh i think we're gonna have a many year stretch of mookie Betts being the consensus best player from the past five to ten years um you you know my rude mookie Betts take right that he doesn't have good fashion he does not have good style so <laughs> mookie Betts famously good at everything he very easily transitioned to playing the infield. Um, and also he bowls really well, apparently. And now he's got a podcast <sighs> really kind of infringing on our territory there. And <laughs> he has very loud, ostentatious personal style. And people are always like, look, he bets style. I got him. Like, no, 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 no. He has <laughs> style, he has intentional style. He wears a lot of clothes that are loud and they are not good. That's my take. That's my take. <laughs> Boogie well, Bats is good at everything else, but his style is not good. I do not enjoy his style. Um, That's all. Okay. Are you going to actually root for either of these teams? Are you actually, when we get to the world, when we get to the postseason, it's October 3rd, 4th, 5th, whenever it starts, will you be rooting for these teams? Well, you you sort of know my thing about I kind of like the best teams to be in the World yeah. Series. Uh, so you will. And I will be rooting for these two teams to make it out of the NL. I don't have a strong lean on one or the other. Uh, I will say you don't have to wait till the postseason to watch these teams play each other. They play later this week. So oh, they do. you can you can watch a series of these two teams starting Thursday. All right. Well, we should have checked on that beforehand. But that was a, that's I also I just that's, told that's, yeah. <laughs> I should have checked on that beforehand. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't act respond with shock and awe. I could have also just not responded with shock and awe and then played it off like I knew it. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a that's a nice little neat way to wrap it up. Uh, we will be back next week with whoever the next two teams with the highest postseason odds or the biggest leads in their division are that's all we've got for you this week thanks to our producer john for making this podcast look and sound great um not i gotta be honest not as cool as if we were on a couch like like moogie Betts and his podcast guests always are we gotta figure out a way to do a podcast like literally together 
that's a thing that they have figured out, the professional athletes that normal podcasters have not figured out. I feel like I can only <laughs> talk to you over <laughs> over the computer or else suddenly we're like, oh, no, it's picking up the audio from each other. Um, make sure you're following both of us on the thing that I'm still calling Twitter or Threads or Blue Sky, where I haven't posted it forever, or Instagram. Um, if you've made it this far, subscribe to the podcast and the YouTube channel. Leave us a five-star review so that way Mookie Betts feels shame that he is not as good at podcasting as we are because he needs to be taken down decides he's, uh, he's good at everything and then i was reading his podcast reviews and i was like people love his podcast too <laughs> i mean it's pretty good he gets great guests he got mike trout to talk to him for like an hour i didn't know mike trout had an hour worth of words in him <laughs> wild we'll be back next week with another episode of the bandwagon